If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. We are going to continue with the typologies now. Remember that uh, at Kadesh, the children didn't go in because of unbelief. Now let's go to another period. Here's our Standard slide, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All of these stories in the Bible relate to us in the last days and we need to learn lessons from them. Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith. It's a sad reality. We can't change it. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. In the time of Kellogg, she was speaking. The omega will be of a most startling nature. So the church has had its alpha and the church will have its omega. That's prophetic. Why do we all choose to capitulate when we find Omega all around us and want to leave the church? It has to be there. The enemy has worked upon the minds of some and has led them to do violence to our past experience by mingling with the truth, erroneous and false theories. He has led ministers and teachers to weave into their doctrines some pleasing figures of his own invention. Even deviation from the truth, as we have advocated it in the past, is a departure from truth and has been witnessed by the Holy Spirit and upon which God has placed his seal. We've had all of these things in the church. We shouldn't be surprised that they're there. It shouldn't make us happy. But we can't change it. While living in Carroll Manor, Ellen White received a vision in which she seemed to be in a large company. This comes from the biographical books written by a nephew. One not known to those present stepped forward and sounded a message of warning to Dr. Paulson and Dr. Sadler, urging them to break their bonds with Dr. Kellogg and to be careful not to spoil their experience with philosophy and vain deceit. Cut loose, cut loose is my message, she wrote in a letter to the physicians. The text of the letter was much the same as in the letter addressed to elders Jones and Wagner, who were now associated with Kellogg in Battle Creek. So even great lights that can give very important messages which are truth can go out. Don't look to individuals. They can fade. The messenger who was speaking to them indicated that these men were in the mist and fog, unaware of the seductive sentiments in the living temple. That's the book that Kellogg wrote with the pantheistic theories. 
She quoted 1 Timothy 4, 1, Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. She added, We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. <laughs> and you know, we always think it's not possible. It's not only possible, it's prophetic. As you all know, I was one of the delegates to the faith and science meetings that our church held to discuss the six-day creation issue. Some of the experiences I had are just <laughs> unbelievable. Unbelievable. We heard all kinds of strange doctrines from leading high up individuals in the church from deans of major faculties, from you name it. You cannot believe that such sentiments can exist within Adventism. We heard panentheism, pantheism, evolutionism, the whole bit. Some of the members were in tears. Some were accusing. It was most startling. And some of the bright lights who I really had appreciated in the past were going out. And it saddened me. So at one stage I took one of the great lights and I took him aside. I went and sat with him at a table and I said, what's happened to you? You weren't like this. What's happened to you? Tell me, what happened? Why would you want to compromise like this? And he looked at me and he lowered his eyes and he said this is the Omega he knew it he was so trapped in it he couldn't loosen the bonds and that's sad isn't it that's so sad fables similar to the heresies in the early days of the message present in the living temple the difficulties that had arisen have been very hard to meet and they are far from being settled yet. One and another and still another are presented to me as having been led to accept the pleasing fables that mean the sanctification of sin. The sanctification of sin is the, is the key to what will happen in the Omega. Sin will be sanctified. In any one of its forms. So the living temple contains the alpha of a train of heresies. These heresies are similar to those. And then she talks about where and what and ever. I bore them a message similar to the message I've been bearing for the last two months. I was instructed that the ideas they had accepted were but the alpha of a great deception. <laughs> It'll get worse. And then God said, leave them. I was forbidden to talk with Dr. Kellogg on this subject because it is not a subject to be talked about. And I was instructed that, a, that certain sentiments in the living temple were alpha of a long list of deceptive theories. So it's not just one thing. It's a spirit that comes into the church. These sentiments have had an effect on our people everywhere. Some think it's strange that I write, do not send your children to Battle Creek. Wow. I was instructed in regard to the danger of the worldly influence in Battle Creek. I have written hundreds of pages regarding the danger of having so large a sanitarium and of calling so many young people together in one place. The young people in Battle Creek are in danger. They will come in contact with error. Is it happening in our modern colleges as well? Aren't they just as large? I've sat in some of our big college congregations and seen the strangest things. Choirs are robed in IHS. <laughs> In his service, please, Isis Horus said. And uh, sermons being preached, Peter is the rock of draw. From our pulpits, have you heard those? 
and worse ones that I don't even want to mention by name. And I wonder, how, how can this be? The young people in Battle Creek are in danger. They will come in contact with error. You know, even in the most conservative areas. areas. I gave a course in one of our colleges on faith and science for years. And then because of commitments and other commitments, I wasn't able to give it. And the very next year, they taught evolution. <laughs> and the students, they couldn't believe it themselves. And some of the lecturers we've come into contact with, they are high up professors in some of our American universities now. Fascinating things that some of these people have taught. Years ago, I do not think that they would meet these errors right in the sanitarium, but when Living Temple came out and some of our ministers told me that there was in it nothing but what I had been teaching all my life, I saw how great the danger was. We are in such danger. Satan is such a wily foe. If I think about the Ford heresies and all of those teachings, I mean, that was removed from the church. But it hasn't left the church. Isn't it still in the church? And if we take the modern translations, which totally eradicate the movement from the holy to the most holy, it's just unbelievable. I was in, the, in uh, Australia, and I listened to some of these sentiments. And there were radio debates and... People like Ford were talking about these things. And it's so clear in the Bible that Jesus went into the holy place and not into the most holy place because he went in with his own blood, didn't he? Not with the blood of goats and pigs. Well, if he went in with his own blood, then surely he couldn't have done service in the holy place before he came to earth. Is, that, is it possible? Because he didn't have that blood yet. So his service could only have started in the holy place after that sacrifice. So that means that at some later stage he must have gone into the most holy. And we have a prophecy, the 2300 day prophecy, which tells us when that event took place. And if we don't have that doctrine, we have nothing. And if you sacrifice that doctrine, then Seventh-day Adventism becomes just another denomination. We're not just another denomination. We are a people her heralding the message that it is judgment hour. The hour of his judgment has come. And that started in 1844, and that makes Seventh-day Adventism special, and it makes it separate, and that is why Satan hates that doctrine, because he wants us to be part of the soup. We're not soup. We're Adventists. Seventh day Adventists. They will come in contact with error. Years ago, I did not think that they would meet these errors right in the sanitarium. But when Living Temple came out and some of the ministers told me there was nothing, story of our life. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Have we seen it? Unfortunately, yes. Three angels' messages can't come with a message like that. It's divisive. It's insulting. It's against the law. It's hate speech. Have you heard of those things? Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the random church would be discarded? Wow. Our religion would be changed? The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. This is not just mere supposition. This is, this is reality. But in spite of it, 
no matter where you go. Like that story of that communist. God gathered a little church of 25 people who still believed everything that this old lady said in the midst of that environment. Can you believe it? He has such a sense of humor. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. I was in a huge publishing facility just across the border. <laughs> and I walked in there thinking, wow, well, perhaps I can find some interesting books. Uh, hmm. <laughs> the, it was very colorful. Not like in the past. You know, the books were one color. Not now anymore. It's very colorful. And all of these books were there. And I went to the sales lady and I said, excuse me, where are the spirit of prophecy books? And she said, oh, right in the back behind those shelves there. I said, okay, thank you. And I went there. And there were a couple. Just a couple. I mean, there are lots of books, right? Lots of books. And I looked at them and I looked at this huge place stacked with books. I said, I'm not going to leave this. I'm going to be in irritation. I mean, it's part of my nature. I might as well be in irritation. <laughs> so I went and I asked, you know, where's the head of this establishment? And they took me to his office. And I said, hi, I'm from South Africa. Uh, I, I've noticed something very interesting in your bookshop. Would you like to come and see, please? And he came with, and we walked to the back. And I said, uh, look here. He says, yes, what? I said, uh, these are the leaves of autumn. <laughs> but uh, why are they hidden behind here? Uh, I thought, these were the leaves of autumn and not those colorful ones out there. Haven't you got your books up the wrong way around? <laughs> oh, he was most disgusted with me. <laughs> Needless to say, this fanatic from Southern Africa. I did the same in one of our European universities. They were so proud of their library. And they had all of these wonderful books. All of them. And all their theologians. And uh, I mentioned their theologians by name. And I said, you know, Jesus I know. <laughs> Paul I know. Ellen White, I know, but who's this Bart fellow over here? <laughs> they had rows and rows and rows and books about and, and on Bart and all of these things, but the, the spirit of prophecy, <laughs> who's this Bart fellow? They didn't like that either. Fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. I've had phone call after phone call after phone call telling me you may not preach this, you may not preach that, you may not preach the other. Uh, fortunately, I'm somewhat deaf on one ear. <laughs> the system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. And the founders of the system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded and as... Also, the God who created it, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. We'll talk some more about this. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. But God being removed, they would place the de their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on sand and a storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. We're going to have it. It's prophetic. If it's not in your church, find one that has it. That's the only solution. Who has authority to begin such a movement? We have our Bibles. We have our experience attested to by miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. We have a truth that admits of no compromise. It's either right or wrong. Shall we not repudiate everything that is not in harmony with this truth? It's our job. But you're not going to be very popular. This is not a popularity contest. You know, people say Christianity is a crutch. Uh -uh, Christianity is not for sissies. I hesitated and delayed about sending out that which the Spirit of the Lord impelled me to write. She didn't even want to write it. Ooh, I can't say this. I did not want to be compelled to present the misleading influence of these sophistries, but in the providence of God, the errors that have been coming in must be met. 
It's our job. The facts relative to Korah and his company who rebelled against Moses and Aaron and against Jehovah are recorded for a warning to God's people, especially those who live upon the earth near the close of time. So we need to study this typology. And if we stay within the realms of the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, we're on safe ground. She said, study that. Look at what the error is and see if you can meet it. That's why God gave us these examples. Satan had led persons to imitate the example of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We have it in the church. And it's interesting that we have a, a religious aspect and a political aspect. Because Korah was the one who wanted to be the spiritual leader, the spiritual high priest, and the others were more, more the diplomatic political aspects. And they wanted to form a union, as it were, within the leadership like a church and state organization. Brilliant. Do we have something like that in our church today? In raising insurrection amongst the people of God, those who permit themselves to rise in opposition to the plain testimony become self-deceived. Such have really thought that those upon whom God has laid the burden of his work were exalted above the people of God and that their counsels and reproofs were uncalled for. They have risen in opposition to the plain testimony which God would have his servants hear in rebuking the wrongs amongst God's people. Uh, I balance these lectures with other lectures like Am I My Brother's Keeper? <laughs> it will also come. There are always two sides to a story. Many for a while were undecided whether to make an entire sacrifice of all these hurtful things or reject the plain testimonies born and yield the clamors of appetite. They occupied an unsettled position. There are many sitting on the fence in this world. Fearful decision at once raged the wall of separation between them, those who, cleansing themselves as God has commanded from all filthiness of the flesh. So all of these things hang together. Your whole spiritual life is a very complex, interwoven system. They said that the people were all right, but it was the reproving testimonies which made the trouble. <laughs> yeah. That guy's okay. I've had some interesting <laughs> experiences with AD. Uh, AD is not the most popular ministry under the sun. I've stuck to them because I believe that it is their earnest desire to spread God's end time message. And I know that they are not enriching themselves in any possible way. This is a very self-sacrificing work. And I've been called in and said, and people have said to me, you know, why don't you distance yourself, please? Because the problem's not with you. The problem's with them. And then these same people are called in and they say, why don't you distance yourself from that guy? The problem's not really with you. The problem's with him. <laughs> Out of the same mouth. Isn't that fascinating? So, the reproving of sins is not welcome in any age. Now, I don't mention any names. Have I mentioned any names? No. I might have mentioned areas, or specific areas even, but I'm not mentioning names. That's not my job. I don't want to belittle anyone. It's the principle that we're talking to and addressing. When the rebellious unfurl their banner, all the disaffected rally around the standard. And all the spiritually defective, the lame, the halt, the blind, unite their influence to scatter and to sow discord. It's just so contagious. And it's so hard to fight. And you really have to weep between the porch and the altar. Every advance of God's servants at the head of the work has been watched with suspicion by those who have had a spirit of insurrection 
and all their actions have been misrepresented by the fault finding until the honest souls have been drawn into the snare of want of correct knowledge. Somebody doesn't speak up, we're lost. You know, I ask myself, did I give up everything out there? I gave up my job at the university. God gave it back, but at the time I gave it up for this truth. I gave up my family. They rejected me. They haven't been to my house for 23 years. Gave up all my old friends for nothing. Did I buy truth just to sell it again within my church? doesn't make any sense. Why would I give it up out there and then embrace the error again in my church? I won't do it. By the grace of God, at least, I won't do it. It is as difficult to undeceive some of these who have permitted themselves to be led into rebellion as it was to convince the rebellious Israelites that they were wrong and that Moses and Aaron were right. It's going to be tough. Even after God, in miraculous manner, caused the earth to swallow up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the leaders in the rebellion, the people still would have it that Moses and Aaron were wrong. That's pretty self-deceived. And that they were responsible that these holy men had died. The Hebrews were not cured of their rebellion until 14,700 of the people who had joined the rebellious had been slain. And then, after all this, God in mercy condescended to perform a remarkable miracle upon the rod of Aaron to settle their minds forever in regards to the priesthood. So this is a fantastic parallel. Ellen White writes in Manuscripts Release Number 9, I question whether genuine rebellion is ever curable. Study in Patriarchs and Prophets the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. This rebellion was extended, including more than 2,000, more than two men. It was led by 250 princes of the congregation, men of renown. So can we expect that we'll have a similar thing in the end time with the men of renown? Call rebellion by its right name and apostasy by its right name and then consider that the experience of the ancient people of God with all its objectionable features was faithfully chronicled to pass into history. The scripture declares these things are written for our admonition. If men and women who have the knowledge of the truth are so far separated from their great leader that they will take the great leader of apostasy and name him Christ our righteousness, it is because they have not sunk their shaft into the mines of truth. They are not able to distinguish the precious ore from the base metal. What's our guide text? Be transformed so that you may prove what is his will. Isn't that so? So we need this transformation. Our church needs this transformation and it needs it now. So, I question if genuine rebellion is ever curable. Deuteronomy 1, 4, 45. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. So you abode in Kadesh many days, according unto the days that you abode there. They could have entered in, right? They were on the borders of Canaan. They could have entered in. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They want these leaders to lead them back to Egypt. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, Nay, we will have a king over us. Wow. People always ask me, what is the best form of government? And without hesitation, I'll say theocracy. Democracy is a lie. It's the ruling of the majority and the majority is always wrong. Isn't it so? 
Yes. We want a king. They rejected the spirit of prophecy. They chose a new leader under Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and 250 princes of Israel went along with it. The movement caused the destruction of 14,700 followers. That's just a small typological number. I wonder what the antitypical number is going to be. For I spoke not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. You know, I battle with this thought. And when I first, as I said, became a Christian, I thought, why does God expect this total obedience? Until you start realizing that this is the best thing in the world for you. It's not that he's a tyrant. It's just that he designed us and he knows what's best for us. And if you do what he says, you're blessed. It's great. If you do it before you, because you have to, it's a start, but it's pathetic. If you do it because you want to, because it's the greatest thing that could ever happen to you, then you're halfway there. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. You shall be my people. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, walked in the counsels in their own imagination of their evil heart, and went backwards and not forwards. So the spirit of Laodicea develops. Yet few at alar are alarmed at the astonishing, or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Since the time of the Minneapolis meeting, I have seen the state of the Laodicean church as never before. So here we have this Kadesh experience. And out of the Kadesh experience, what do we get? We get a rebellion. The Adventist church has a Kadesh experience, 1888. After that, a rebellion. We're doing the exact same thing. I've heard the rebuke of God spoken to those who feel so well satisfied, who know not their spiritual destitution. Jesus speaks to these as he did to the woman in Samaria. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that says to thee, give me drink, thou wouldst have asked him and he would have given thee living water. Our church needs this. Like the Jews, many have closed their eyes lest they should see. But there is as great peril now in closing the eyes to light and walking apart from Christ, feeling need of nothing, as there was when he was on earth. Those who resist the messages of God through his humble servant think they are at variance with Sister White because our ideas are not in harmony with theirs. But this variance is not with Sister White, but with the Lord who has given her work to do. This is probably the greatest problem in the church. And how they try to swing around it, even those who claim to believe it, boggles my mind. She was probably influenced by the margin of the King James Version to say what she said. Oops. So put my hand up. What else was she influenced by to say what she said? The wilderness wandering was not only ordained as a judgment upon the rebels and murderers, but it was to serve as a discipline for the rising generation preparatory to their entrance into the promised land. Moses declared, as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So you have to go through everything we're going through. The hunger experience, the mana experience, and we have to do the same. What's going to sustain us in this crisis? Mana. We have to eat it. We have to internalize it. We have to live in harmony with it. And we have to stop grumbling. He found him in a desert land, in a waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. This rebellious people. You know what's fascinating? Here they rebel, and the whole lot of them have to go back. Why couldn't Caleb, Joshua, 
Aaron, Moses, Miriam, going to the promised land. Did they do anything wrong at that stage? No. They had to turn back and go with this grumbling, mumbling, muttering people. And so the Aaron's, the Moses's, and all of those today have to just go back and be with this grumbling, muttering people. Now let's look at the doctrine of Korah, because this is fascinating. Number 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Esau, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, Dathan and, uh, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, the son of Pelet, the son of Reuben. Why do you think he gives the genealogy? Because in the second commandment he says, unto the children of the third and fourth generation. We'll come to that later. It gets very interesting. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Do you think that's written for our admonition? So when we see this, people tell me they're going to leave the church. Moses never left the church. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Okay. Here's one of the problems. Every one of them, and the Lord is amongst them, wherefore then lift ye up yourself above the congregation of the Lord. Why should the Lord speak only through you? He doesn't. Why can't he speak to me? The Lord showed me that I have to do this, that, and the other. Do we hear that in the church? Sinners versus holy. Thus Korah and his associates gained their attention and enlisted the support of the congregation. The charge that the murmuring of the people had brought upon them, the wrath of God was declared to be a mistake. They said that the congregations were not at fault since they desired nothing more than their rights. I like that is the spirit of today. But that Moses was an overbearing ruler and he had reproved the people as sinners. They were a holy people and the Lord was among them. We have the same attitude today. The Lord doesn't care about what you dress or what you eat or what you do. That's legalism. That's pathetic. All you have to do is love him. And he will accept you just the way you are and that'll be fine. And the way we get people into the church is not with truth and with preaching. No, we have coffee clubs and we have uh, music and this and that and the other and the Lord will accept this as your best worship. Do we have it today? Uh -huh. Korah reviewed the history of their travels through the wilderness where they had been brought into straight places and many had perished because of their murmurings and disobedience. His hearers thought they saw clearly that their trouble might have been prevented if Moses had pursued a different course. And as for this Ellen White, I mean, wow, 19th century thinking to be imposed on us, some fuddy-duddy old lady. By the way, she wasn't an old lady. She was 17 years old when she became a prophet. That's a child. That's a child. They decided that all their disasters were chargeable to him and that their exclusion from Canaan was inconsequent of the mismanagement of Moses and Aaron. Well, the Adventist church said, we can't stand your bickering anymore. And they shipped her off to Australia, remember? If Korah would be their leader and would encourage them by dwelling upon their good deeds instead of reproving their sins, that would be great. They had been flattered by Korah hmm. and his company until they really believed themselves to be very good people. And this is our modern theology. This is the preaching we have today. 
Never ever say anything that ripples the waters. Let's be sweet and gentle. We're all good people. Go and do your good works and prove to everyone that you are good people. And uh, thousands will come into the church. I was in a very northern country in Europe. <laughs> and the leadership called me in and said to me, you will please not preach everything that you preach here. I see you're doing a campaign. We don't do that this way here. We have excellent relations with all the churches and we don't want them destroyed. And we want you to speak to our top man in this regard. And so I went and spoke to him. And he said to me, you will not do it. And I said, well, give me a good reason why I should not call a spade a spade and <laughs> call the papacy antichrist and naughty things like that. And he said he had all these good relations and for years, for something like, I can't remember, 18 years. Oh, and there were representatives from other areas having gone to warn. Oh, interesting story. And then... Uh, he had all these good relations and he was with the priests and the, this and the other pastors and they exchanged the pulpits and the, they were having wonderful times together for 18 years. I said, that's wonderful. How many have become Adventists? No, none of them. So I said, well then your evangelism doesn't work very well. Could you please leave me to my kind of evangelism? <laughs> Ooh, that was a drama. And then even those that were for the message said, please, will you not say anything about dairy? Because all our nation eats dairy. I said, yes, that's why they're so sick. Maybe they need to be helped. Oh, what a nightmare. <laughs> what a nightmare. Flatter the people. Flatter them. Tell them they're all holy. How do you want to get people to change if you don't tell them why they have to change? Right? They tell me you're not allowed to say the things you're saying because you offend the Roman Catholics. No, it changed the Roman Catholics. I've had a Roman Catholic priest phone me and say, thank you for your message. I'm no longer a Roman Catholic priest. He actually said, thank you for setting me free from those fetters that bound me. Isn't that nice? Do I hate Roman Catholics because I preach this message? On the contrary. If I hated them, I'd keep dead quiet, not say anything. They had fondly cherished the hope that a new order of things was about to be established in which praise would be substituted for reproof. <laughs> this is powerful. And ease for anxiety and conflict. Man. I can see my church written right there. The men who had perished had spoken flattering words and had professed great interest and love for them. They were so kind. And they're so nice. It's such a nice people. You know, sometimes nice can be the road to hell. And the people concluded that Korah and his companions must have been good men and that Moses had by some means been the cause of their destruction. That's how self-deceived they became. So after 1888, Satan likewise brought in extremes into the Adventist movement to counterfeit the righteousness by faith message. And we had the Holy Flesh movement. doesn't matter what you do in the body. It doesn't matter whether you fornicate, eat, food is for the belly, belly is for the food. All of this was in the Adventist church. Under that early condition, it will be back in the late condition as well. The whole congregation is holy. Pantheism was the alpha apostasy. Pantheism will be the final apostasy. If I preach evolution in any one of my colleges, or if this church preaches any evolution in any one of its colleges, it's pantheism. Because you are progressing to perfection. Isn't that right? Wow. Many offshoot movements were spawned, many claiming the church had become Babylon. 
So all of these things. Charge it not to God. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination for many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong actions, course of action. We may hasten the day by giving the gospel to the world. It is in our power to hasten the return. The other point is the enemy is mocked. Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it is the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, that thou Lord, are amongst this people, that thou, Lord, hast art seen face to face and that thy cloud standeth over them and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. We've become a byword. We're not held in that awe that we should be held with, held in. We're just another ecumenical member. He, the nations, have reproached the Lord and his people because the Hebrews had failed to take possession of Canaan, as they expected soon after leaving Egypt. Their enemies had triumphed because Israel had wandered so long in the wilderness, and they'd mockingly declared that the God of the Hebrews was not able to bring them into the promised land. Have they mocked Seventh-day Adventists? Whew. Read the web pages. I get packs of them like this. And everything about Ellen White, how false prophet she is. Have you seen those packs and packs and packs of things? And when I, I actually went through them all because I have to do evangelism, I have to be able to answer these things. What ignorance. What total ignorance. And Satan has piled it up against this church. And in spite of it, he's losing souls. So who's really in control? God is in control. The Lord had now signally manifested his power and favor in opening the Jordan before his people, and the enemies could no longer reproach them. That's when they came the next time. Deuteronomy 2.1 Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke unto me. And we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And those many days were actually 38 years. 38 years. And in the space in which they came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over Brook Zered was 38 years until all the generation of men of war were wasted out from amongst the host, as the Lord swear unto them. Now let's jump to Jeremiah, who is the prophet living at the time of the second siege. For I spoke not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifice, but this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, I will be your God. You shall be my people. You shall walk in all the ways that I commanded you, that it may be well with you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, walked in the counsel and in the imagination of their evil hearts and went backwards and not forwards. So how far do we want to retreat? Do we want to go all the way to Egyptian slavery or back to the Babylonian captivity? Is that how far we want to go as a church? The church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt, disbelief in the testimonies, or leavening the church. Satan would have it thus. Ministers preach self instead of Christ. That's a Shula doctrine. Do we have that in our churches today? Surely not. The testimonies are unread, unappreciated. But if they are read, we're told they're good for homiletics, but not for exegesis. Or I read them for my family worship, but I can't use them 
to be explicit about certain points. Light has been shining from his word, from the ten testimonies. Excuse me. Light from his word. Does that sound like exegesis? Sounds like exegesis to me. The result is apparent in the lack of purity and devotion and earnest faith amongst us. I feel sad when I think how for long years there's been a gradual lowering of the standards. So our solution is raise the standard again. Jesus didn't come to lower the standard, he came to raise it. Let us raise it. I've been shown that the very few realize the constant presence of the divine watcher, I know thy works. All such are foolish versions. They have no abiding consolation. If we want victory, then we have to overcome the world. Do not the scripture call for a more pure and holy work than we have yet seen? God calls upon those who are willing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to lead out in a work of thorough reformation. Here's a small group. There's a job. And start at home. Start here. Start here. Be an example. And be kind. And be generous. And be loving. Our people were moving into line, responding to God's call. It's going to come. People are going to come back. During these years, the people were constantly reminded that they were under divine rebuke. Now, I'd like you to point out this point to you. Here was a people. They could have gone in. They didn't go in. They're still here. Is that us today? Yes. They were under divine rebuke. Are we under divine rebuke? Yes or no? Yes. Our whole church is under divine rebuke. This is very important. In the rebellion at Kadesh, they had rejected God, and God had for a time rejected them. They were still God's people, though. The pillar of cloud was still in front of them. It was still God's people. Since they had proved unfaithful to his covenant and were not to receive the sign of the covenant, the rite of circumcision, they were not circumcised. In that entire period, there was no circumcision. Did you know that? No circumcision. And the circumcision is a symbol of the circumcision of the heart. So our entire church does not have the circumcision of the heart as a church. They were forbidden to do the ritual. Their desire to return to the land of slavery had showed them to be unworthy of freedom and the ordinance of the Passover instituted to commemorate the deliverance from bondage was also not observed. They weren't allowed to circumcise and they were not allowed to keep the Passover. Same with us. Same with us. Now when was the divine rebuke removed? That's important. Because I want to know where the type leads to. Where am I standing in the stream of time? <clears throat> Joshua 5, 7. And the children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. So this was just before going into Canaan. For they were uncircumcised. Because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their place in the camp and the, till they were whole. <laughs> oh, there's beautiful typology here. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Do we have the reproach of Egypt upon us? Yes. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. So when was it removed? Just before they entered into Canaan. I hear the rumbling. <laughs> Is that going to be soon? Yes. You know, I often wonder, Lord, why is there no power in your church? You know, I've had such close experiences, like Mark Woodman, 35 years old, 
doing everything right, dying in front of your eyes, just dissipating, praying, anointing, doing everything in our power, it's gone. And how many of us wonder, Lord, where are the days when you poured out that spirit and people were healed. In the early Adventist church, were there miraculous healings, yes or no? Yes. It's not happening now. Oh, I know of people who were healed as well. It's not as if I don't know of people that weren't healed. Even miraculously healed. Some I know very close who had melanomes on their faces kept on praying while the face stood like this and the surgeons were waiting to do it and he said, no, I have to do my duty towards God then they can cut this thing out and during the leg, gone. I know someone like that. So I know there are miraculous things that happened in the church but generally speaking, it's as though we are without power. Have you noticed that? We're under divine rebuke. That's the answer. The stone of reproach has not been rolled off us yet. But that day is coming. A short distance from Jordan, the Hebrews made their first encampment in Canaan. Here Joshua circumcised the children of Israel. A short distance from the Jordan. I believe we're a short distance from the Jordan. And there they encamped. And the rite of circumcision was performed upon all the people who had been born in the wilderness. If you don't have a wilderness experience of God, you will not receive the rite of circumcision. If you don't feel chastised by God, you are not his child. So if things are tough, I, I started a sermon one. How are you all doing this morning? No, we're all great. And I said, okay, I can go home. You're all in the wrong church. <laughs> Must be tough. I mean, you have your good days too, but generally speaking, it's not easy. Circumcision is a sign of cutting off the sins from the heart, a seal of the righteousness by faith. If we don't accept righteousness by faith, if we think that this reproof can be removed through our works, we're missing the boat. Not perfectionism and not bedlam of noise will take it away. Change of heart. That's it. But he is a Jew, he is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Like Ellen White says, don't say you're perfect. Let God write it if he wants to, but we should never, never utter it. We should always feel with the sinner, remembering that we are just dust. We are no better than anyone else. And he received the sign of the circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. That he might be the father of all them that believe that though by circum they be circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to unto them also. If we don't accept our condition and accept that only Christ can save us, we won't receive it. So we are under the same rebuke and the stone of reproach will be rolled back only when we cross the Jordan. Brothers and sisters, we're close. And here's the good news. They were not forsaken. They were just under divine rebuke. We're not forsaken. Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. <laughs> That's it. That's the bottom line. There's no, there's no easy way. I've been shown that unbelief in the testimonies is a big problem. I saw that at present we were under divine forbearance. What I'm saying, is it biblical and spirit of prophecy, yes or no? Yes. And people will say, no, it's not true. Come and look at the power we have in our church. No. I don't want to listen to a bedlam of noise. 
I want to know, do you have a relationship with God or don't you? The rebuke of God is upon us because of our neglect of solemn responsibility. His blessings have been withdrawn because the testimonies he has given have not been heeded by those who profess to believe in them. That's serious. I mean, if leaders in the church start telling us that we can't use the testimonies for certain things, then uh, we're in a sad shape. Or if people say that was for a previous century, oh, for a religious awakening. The angels of God are going from church to church doing their duty, and Christ is knocking at the door of your hearts for entrance. But the means that God has devised to awaken the churches to a center of their spiritual destitution have not been regarded. We must have a total transformation. How shall the reproof be given? Let the apostles answer. And here's the answer. With long suffering and doctrine. We've got that on our side. We have the doctrine. We must be patient, kind, gentle, all of those things. Principles should be brought to bear upon the one who needs reproof, but never should the wrongs of God's people be passed by indifferently. We have such clear instruction. If we would only read it, there will be men and women who despise reproof and whose feelings will ever rise up against it. It is not pleasant to be told our wrongs. You know, if somebody knows you well and comes and tells you, where you are wrong, you can rise up against it, but you can say, thank you for being a good friend. Thankful, thank you for telling me what I'm like. I'll try and do better. It is not pleasant to be told our wrongs. It's almost every case where reproof is necessary. There will be some who entirely overlook the fact that the Spirit of the Lord has been grieved. We are not to be policemen. Ellen White also said it is not our duty to tell others precisely what all their sins are. That's not the way to do it. We're not policemen. All this unsanctified sympathy places the sympathizers with where they are sharers in the guilt of the one reproved. So all this sympathy with Korah and the rebellion and all of those things, many who complacently listen to the truth from God's word are dead spiritually while they profess to live. The entreaties of the Spirit of God like divine melody, the promises of His Word so rich and abundant, its threatenings against idolatry and obedience, all are powerless to melt the world-hardened heart. He found them in the desert, howling wilderness. Forty years suffered he their manna in the wilderness. Even Caleb, Joshua, and Moses were divinely led back into the wilderness. They did not start a new movement. They did not isolate themselves. Neither will we do it. Thou art a holy people unto Jehovah thy God. Irrespective of the divine rebuke, Jehovah thy God has chosen thee to be a people for his own possession. He did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number or great or whatever. You were few, but because he loves you. That's so nice. As many as I love, I rebuke, chasten, be zealous, repent. Amen. Amen.